Hello, my name is Daniel. If there's one video you want to watch before buying an air conditioner, this is the one. So the first thing we have to do is understand a few basics of air conditioning and heating. And don't worry, I have done this presentation hundreds of times and the feedback I got from customers all over the spectrum is that they were able to follow what I was talking about and no one else has explained it so clearly. So, you may have used one of these cans in the past. It's a can you use to spray your keyboard clean. Uh, it's just got air in it. And you know what happens when you spray these for a few seconds? They get cold, very cold. So what's driving that? It's a law of nature that says if you take gas from a high pressure and you release it, it will cool down. And that's the principle that drives air conditioning. Let me show you. So outside your house, you have a condenser. That condenser has a compressor inside it. It's also the thing with the big fan blade blowing air out above it. Inside the house, you typically have a stack that looks like this. There's a coil at the top and the coil is shaped like an A. There's a sort of 3D rendering of it. And this coil has got lines running back and forth through it like this. There's also copper lines that connect this coil to the outside condenser. So what happens is the compressor, this is the compressor part of the condenser, this whole piece is called the condenser. The compressor sends gas up under pressure and when it gets there, it releases it. And just like the demo with this can, this thing gets super cold. In fact, 32 degrees. And that's why it can freeze up sometimes. You've heard of air conditioners freezing. That's because that coil gets to freezing or below. The other line is taking heat out of the house. If you've ever went and stood outside and felt the air blowing out above this condenser in the summertime, there's warm air blowing out. Why is there warm air blowing out? It's because we are removing heat from the house. And that's what you can feel over here. Now, um, this part, the coil, is at the top of your furnace. And it's usually a different color or a slightly different size. So it's easy to recognize. Then you have your furnace, which consists of these metal pipes that burn gas flames in between metal plates. There's actually a set of two plates that's the typical configuration. There are other ways they build these things. The carbon monoxide that escapes comes out through a metal flue like that. If you see one of those six inch metal flues, then you have one of these. And 20% of the heat escapes through this flue and goes up through the roof. That means this is an 80% furnace. Now, you can get, in very cold climates, they would typically have a 90% furnace, or they would be more popular in colder climates. Uh, I live in Georgia, and in the south, this is the majority of what is used. A 90% furnace will have a PVC pipe, and that pipe will typically go straight out to the side of the house. It will not go through the roof. So a quick way to recognize whether you have an 80% or a 90 plus furnace, because they can be more efficient than 90%. You can get ones that go up to 99%. Uh, it's going to have a PVC pipe going to the outside. Those furnaces are more complex. They have additional heat exchangers built into them and they cost quite a bit more. Then you have a blower motor. You have a plenum, which is that big box that you see on the side with ducts coming into it. And your filter is typically going to be located right there. And then you have a plenum, which is another big box at the top here with ducts going out. And this gets distributed to various parts of your house like that. So air comes into the system. It gets filtered as it comes through there. The blower motor blows it up. It either warms it up 
as the air blows through these heat exchanger plates or get, get, it gets cooled down as it, dry, as it blows through here and that's the cold air that you feel blowing out of your vents. That same air is recirculated back like this. That's why you have supply vents and you have return vents that brings air back. So as you can see, we are always moving air through the system. And that's why it's called air conditioning. We're conditioning the air. We're not bringing air in from the outside. The houses have some natural leakage. And there may be some situations where the system is configured to do that. But for the most part, we are just recirculating the same air and either bringing the temperature down or taking it up. However, there's another thing that happens. As you move air over this, water droplets start forming on this coil. And these run down and there's a bucket underneath here shaped like that. It's designed so that you can blow air through it. But these buckets basically run like this and they catch that condensate that drops into them. That condensate is then run to the outside. Sometimes depending on your configuration you will have a pump here and it pumps it to the outside from there. Or if it's a gravity fed system it will just take it directly outside. So you have a built-in dehumidifier as part of your air conditioner. It's the secondary effect of what happens when you air condition a home. Now, in states like Georgia, where the summers are very humid, we sometimes have a situation where the weatherman tells us it's 93, but it feels like 100. And the thing that makes that happen is humidity. Well, the same is true inside your house. So removing humidity is a critical part of what we do with air conditioning. So this is what we call an AC and gas system. The AC portion is this condenser on the outside and the coil. And these two parts are responsible for cooling. That's all they do. Then the furnace, which also contains the blower motor, which is the motor that distributes all the air through the house, is only capable of warming or heating. So you may have heard of a heat pump. Well, what a heat pump is, is it's slightly bigger on the outside and a heat pump will bring heat in from the outside to the inside even when it's cold outside. Think about that. We're bringing heat in from the outside to the inside even when it's cold outside. So how does that work? First of all, the technology has been around since the 60s. It's incredible and it's very popular in warmer climates like Florida and to some degree Georgia. So when you have mild winter temperatures from 60 down to about 40, what they do is they cool this equipment down to let's say 30. That difference is like a vacuum to the higher temperature. Think of a colder temperature as a vacuum to a higher temperature. So this difference moves into this equipment and that means heat. And that then they reverse this process. So now the heat that's captured in this equipment goes up here and now you are capable of warming up the coil as well as cooling it down because this process is reversed. So that's all well and fine until you get below 40. Then what happens if you don't have gas and you're completely reliable on electrical heat, then you'll have what's called supplemental heat strips. These are wires that require a 220 volt 60 amp a thick old wire like that line that then burns these red hot wires that the air is blown over once you get below 40. In some cases it may be even lower depending on the efficiency of the heat pump. Now what you can do if you like the efficiency of a heat pump you can actually combine it with your gas system if you have gas. And what that means is once we get below 40 or whatever the minimum temperature is for that that heat pump uh, is configured to change to supplemental heat then the gas will kick on. 
So below 40, you can start burning gas. And that system is called a dual fuel system because it has two sources of heat. In the eyes of the IRS, it is a heat pump. And in some cases, a heat pump can get you a $2,000 tax credit. So in other cases, an AC system, and this is recorded in early 2024, this is part of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, and it's going to run for many years to come where these credits are available. If you have an AC that's configured correctly, you can get a $600 tax credit. Typically, to get a dual fuel system, you may pay $2,000 more, but you're going to get it back in the form of a prepaid tax amount. So it's a tax credit. It's not based on your income. It's just based on the equipment you're buying. So if you're looking for something a little bit more efficient, this dual fuel system is very highly recommended. All right, enough on heat pumps. Let's talk about humidity removal and sizing and what the relationship is between those two and why it's so important to have a correctly sized unit. Obviously, if you have a 2,000 square foot house, it's going to need a different size unit than if you have a 3,000 square foot house. Um, factors that will also impact size is the type of insulation you have, the uh, size of the windows, the type of windows, the way the, the house is angled. There's a lot that goes into sizing. Typically what I do is I go look at Zillow and see what the square footage is of my customer's house. I then have the benefit of signing up for a company that provides me with a load report. So I don't have to go there and measure up the whole house. There are definitely some technical things I look at but instead of doing a whole new load calculation, I can pull a load report and the first thing I do is verify that the square footage is the same that I see on Zillow. Sometimes I'd find differences and it may be related to having had another room added or a basement finish out and I can allow for those things when I get down to the actual size that this customer needs. So let's talk about the type of technologies and we'll tie it back to sizing here in just a minute. The oldest technology, the one that most people have that we've lived with for many years, is called single stage technology. And what that means is this motor is either on or off. And the same with this blower. It's either on or off, like a light switch. There's nothing in between. So let's say you step away from your house and you let the temperature get up to 80 degrees. You come back home and you punch it down to 70. The temperature curve is going to go 68, 72, 68, 72, and so on. It's quite a bit wider than people realize. So when you first turn it on, when you first punch it down, both these motors are coming on with everything they have. They're on, 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 and the house starts getting colder, and then boom. At 68, it's off. Now, both of them are off, 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 and the house starts getting warmer. And at 72, boom, it's back on. And so it goes. It's either on or off, and on and off. So the first question about this is, why don't they just turn it off over here and on over there and off over there and on over there and so on. Why do they let it go so wide? And remember those days when we had those old thermostats that you moved by hand and sometimes your dad would put it at 70 and then at about 71, close to 72, your mom would go, it's hot in here and she'd move it and your dad say, leave it alone, it's supposed to do that. Well, nowadays we have electronic thermostats. So when we put them at 70, we can look at it and go, okay, it's set for 70. But the fact is, it's still running at this wider temperature range. And the reason it's doing that is it's trying to protect your equipment. If these motors turned on and off multiple times per hour, you would, you would lose these motors in very short order. The most often replaced part in all of air conditioning is a capacitor, which is a little device it's about this big, that stores energy and throws it at that motor every time that motor starts. 
usually when I mention this, people nod and say, yeah, I've bought several of those in the course of my previous air conditioner's life. So it takes a lot of energy and it puts a lot of stress on that motor to instantly get it into motion. And for that reason, you have this wider curve. Not very efficient and not very comfortable either. It takes about as much energy to start this motor as it does to run it. Now imagine pushing a car down, let's say you have a push, push a car a mile down the road and it's a perfectly straight road and you start pushing it and every 20 feet somebody puts the brakes on. How much energy is it going to take to start pushing again versus starting to push using all that energy and then deciding if you want to push a little bit faster or slower. That's what's going to be described here, which is variable speed technology. But before we get there, there's this. The time it takes for your house to get from 68 to 72 is based on the insulation and the temperature difference. How hot is it outside? How well insulated is the house? is going to determine how long that curve takes. You can have a situation like this where this downward curve is cut short dramatically. And this is called short cycling. Now what is it that determines how quickly we cool the house down? It's the size. So if you have a situation like this where you cut this time down every time the unit turns on and the house just gets cold like that. This is called short cycling. And you can do a Google search, the EPA warns against that. In America, we like things big and strong. And sometimes a salesperson would come along and say, yeah, yeah, uh, we should put a bigger one in. Your husband likes it at 68 or whatever it is. And it sounds good to put a bigger one in. However, what do we know about humidity removal? We know that as long as this unit is running, we are removing humidity. If we cut this time short, then we have a house that gets cold and feels terrible because we're not removing enough humidity. I've seen a house that was sized for a three ton unit and it had a five ton unit in it. The customer walked me around and every closet door she opened showed mold growing inside the closets. It was the classical oversized short cycling situation. So sizing is very critical, particularly if you're going to buy a single stage unit. So now let's talk about variable speed technology and the steps in between. So what they did is they developed motors, variable speed motors that will, depending on the manufacturer, these numbers vary a little bit, but typically it will come on at 30% and run to 100% and everything in between. So you could also call it 70 stages. And they have that variable speed technology both on the indoor and the outdoor equipment. So what that curve looks like is like this. Let's say you let the house get up to 80, you come back and punch it down to 70. It's going to come down and then it's going to stay within a half a degree of what you have on that thermostat. Remarkable. So let's say that this is the hot part of the day. The sun is rising and by three o'clock, four o'clock, there's maximum exposure on the house. What will happen is when you first punch it down, this unit is going to turn on with everything it has and run at 100% capacity. And then it's going to come down and cruise along and go up and down as it needs to. So let's say it gets really hot this part of the day, it's going to run at 100%. And then it's just going to cruise along as needed. Think about it. When they do these load reports, they calculate for an outdoor temperature of 92 degrees. And they calculate for an indoor temperature of between 70 and 75 degrees. So that's kind of a worst case scenario. So if you're saying, I need a three ton unit because for a few days out of the year, that's the maximum capacity I'm going to require. The fact is you're not going to require it every day. For a large part of the year, you're really going to be fine running at 40, 50, 60% capacity. And 
that's also going to change on an hour to hour and a day to day basis. So what happens here is this motor gets started and instead of having this on off on off scenario, it just ramps itself up and down as needed. Think of it as driving on cruise control. Imagine doing a 10 hour trip and you have two options. You're either at full gas or no gas, full gas or no gas versus using cruise control. And as you come up a hill, it's going to ramp itself up. And on the other side of the hill, it's going to throttle down. That's what variable speed technology is. Now, there is a step in between that where the temperature curve would look more like this. It's not quite as good as that. And this is called two-stage technology, where the unit will, um, will come on and it will sort of do this before it turns off. And when it comes on again, it will run at 50% and then goes to 100% and so on. Um, in my opinion, two-stage technology is not as exciting. The price that you pay to go from here to here, I don't think is always worth it. And that's just my personal opinion. If you're really budget driven and you say, I don't want to spend that, I can tell you that these new uh, single stage units are super energy efficient. If you say, that sounds good and I'm interested in the comfort aspect of it, my advice is just push it up to full variable speed technology. So what's the expectation when you have a salesperson coming to your house to talk about buying a new unit? They're also called comfort consultants or comfort advisors in the industry. Well, as you can see from this, the first thing they should look at is sizing. And they should either have done a load report, pulled one like I would be able to do, or do one there, or at least have an in-depth discussion about you about what's going on. Um, as I mentioned, the lady that I saw that had a house that needed a three-ton one and had a five-ton one, there was very clear evidence of an oversized short cycling situation. So you do want to see that your salesperson is investigating that. If you don't, that should be a red flag. The other thing you expect your salesperson to ask is, are there areas that get too warm or too cold? That's really critical because there are remedies to these situations. You can have a room above the garage where the insulation isn't very good. You can have uh, two children's bedrooms where uh, the return vent is sitting in the passageway and the air is supposed to blow into their rooms under the carpet and find its way back to that return in the passage. And maybe you replaced the carpet two years ago and the new pile is sticking up so high against the door that the air is blowing into that room and is not finding its way out. Well, as you know, we have to circulate that air through the house. So if it's just blowing into the room and it's not getting out to be recirculated, you're not really air conditioning that room. So that question has to be asked. And in a case like that, you can add uh, another return vent inside that room, or you can get a handyman to cut a bigger gap under that door, make sure that that air is moving through it. So those are really critical things. The fact is you're going to want somebody who's going to listen to you, find out what's going on, see if there's an opportunity to perhaps dramatically increase the quality of the air in your house and what are the solutions available. Well, now you may ask, well, how much money can I save if I go up in technology? So most people that we see have a 10 SEER unit. SEER stands for Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio. It's just a testing method that was developed by the EPA to test the efficiency. They've all since developed SEER 2 and SEER 2 ratings looks at the combination of equipment to give us a SEER rating. So you may have a situation where this unit is rated at a 17 SEER and the SEER 2 rating is a 15.8. And by changing to a different coil or changing to a different furnace, this rating may go up to a 16. And making that kind of tweak can sometimes get you into the situation where you get the tax credit. So um, last year in 2023, our entry level product was a 14 SEER. Well, beginning of 2024, 14 SEER is no longer legal for installation in the South region. There may be some parts of the country where they still allow them. 
So some companies went up to a 15 seer. Lennox decided to start at a 17 seer with this one plus one technology or single stage technology. And this would be your good option, for example, or some companies may call this a bronze. Then uh, you could have various combinations of two stage technology where you can have a 17 sear with a one stage plus two stage technology, meaning this piece of equipment is still one stage. It's either going to be on or off, but this motor will run at two stages. Some benefit there, in my opinion, not wonderful. You really need to consider this. And this is where it gets really excellent, where you have variable speed plus variable speed, both on the outside and the inside. Again, why is that so important? Because we're always moving air over that coil and therefore we're removing humidity. And to the degree that we remove humidity, the house will feel better. So, savings. Last year, if somebody bought a 14 seer unit, uh, they, and they are online saving calculators um, that I will link to in this uh, video, uh, the savings was $3,150 over a 15-year period. If you look at the um, savings from 10 seer to 17 seer, it's up to $4,500 over a 15-year period. And then if you look at the saving from a 15 to an 18 seer, and there are seer levels above that, it's $4,800. So the bottom of the scale has moved up, right? The saving $4,800 compared to $4,500 for this entry level is not that big a saving. You may ask, well, what's the cost difference between this and that? And it's fairly significant. It can be four dollars to $5,000. So that's how much more you would pay to go from single stage to full variable speed. So if your purpose is purely to save money over the next 15 years, what you need to know is that the entry level equipment is so efficient now that you will save quite a lot, even with the entry level equipment, particularly if you start with a 17 seer. The additional saving by going to an 18 seer is only another $300 over 15 years. That's nothing. So saying, well, I want to spend four to five thousand dollars more because I want to save more. That doesn't compute. So why would people buy the full variable speed systems? Well, comfort. And I have another video on my website where I talk about um, some of my discoveries of comfort. And I would encourage you to watch that one because that's where you'll learn why it is that I have full variable speed systems in my house. The customers who buy these systems are often older retired couples with money in the bank who said we've worked all our life and we want the best for the rest of our years. Or they're very well informed consumers. Once you really know what this is going to do for you, it's well worth that investment. How much more would you pay to drive a nicer car? $5,000, 10, 20, 30,000? Probably all of the above, just because you like the way it drives. So you wanna go from point A to point B, and some people are happy driving something very basic, and others say, I wanna have a better experience. Well, you're going to experience this technology for eight hours every night, and a lot of people work from home. So I hope this encourages you to take a good hard look at rewarding yourself with a really nice variable speed unit. All right, I finally want to talk about filters and air quality. At a minimum, you should get a five inch filter over here. Um, there are online videos that will show you the airflow through a five inch filter. You don't have to change them that often, once a year in most cases. The airflow through them is so much better that it doesn't put all this pressure. If you look at the one inch filter industry, it's really doing the industry a disservice. You've got these little um, cover plates that fall off and dirt gets in there. And by upgrading to a five inch filter, you can have a much higher quality filter in there. 
You can buy them on Amazon for very uh, reasonable prices. You don't have to change them that often. Your system will be happier. Uh, your family will be happier. So uh, please ask your salesperson about a five inch filter. If you do suffer from allergies or asthma or things like that, um, that's another video and there's all kinds of solutions available in that field. All right, thank you for watching. I'm sure you have a much better idea of what to expect from a salesman who's gonna take care of providing a solution that's gonna keep you very comfortable and happy for many years to come. If you should be looking for the opportunity to get an online price for a system replacement, you will find the link below. Thank you for watching.